An almost hysterical antagonism toward the gold standard is one issue which unites status of all persuasions. They seem to sense, perhaps more clearly and subtly than many consistent defenders of laissez-faire, that gold and economic freedom are inseparable, that the gold standard is an instrument of laissez-faire, and that each implies and requires the other. A free banking system based on gold is able to extend credit and thus to create banknotes or currency and deposits according to the production requirements of the economy. Individual owners of gold are induced by payments of interest to deposit their gold in a bank against which they can draw checks. But since it is rarely the case that all depositors want to withdraw all their gold at the same time, the banker need only keep a fraction of his total deposits in gold as reserves. This enables the banker to loan out more than the amount of his gold deposits, which means that he holds claims to gold rather than gold as security of his deposits. But the amount of loans which he can afford to make is not arbitrary. He has to gauge it in relation to his reserves and to the status of his investments. When banks loan money to finance productive and profitable endeavors, the loans are paid off rapidly and bank credit continues to be generally available. But when the business ventures financed by bank credit are less profitable and slow to pay off, bankers soon find that their loans outstanding are excessive relative to the gold reserves, and they begin to curtail new lending, usually by charging higher interest rates. This tends to restrict the financing of new ventures and requires the existing borrowers to improve their profitability before they can obtain credit for further expansion. Thus, under the gold standard, a free banking system stands as the protector of an economy's stability and balanced growth. When gold is accepted as the medium of exchange by most or all nations, an unhampered free international gold standard serves to foster a worldwide division of labor and the broadest international trade. Even though the units of exchange, the dollar, the pound, the franc, etc., differ from country to country, when all are defined in terms of gold, the economies of the different countries act as one, so long as there are no restraints on trade or on the movement of capital. Credit, interest rates, and prices tend to follow similar patterns in all countries. For example, if banks in one country extend credit too liberally, interest rates in that country will tend to fall, inducing depositors to shift their gold to higher interest paying banks in other countries. This will immediately cause a shortage of bank reserves in the easy money country, inducing tighter credit standards and a return to competitively higher interest rates again. A fully free banking system and fully consistent gold standard have not as yet been achieved, but prior to World War I, the banking system in the United States and in most of the world was based on gold, and even though governments intervened occasionally, banking was more free than controlled. Periodically, as a result of overly rapid credit expansion, banks became loaned up to the limit of their gold reserves. Interest rates rose sharply, new credit was cut off, and the economy went into a sharp but short-lived recession. Compared with the depressions of 1920 and 1932, the pre-World War I business declines were mild indeed. It was limited gold reserves that stopped the unbalanced expansions of business activity before they could develop into the post-World War I type of disaster. The readjustment periods were short and the economies quickly re-established a sound basis to resume expansion. But the process of cure was misdiagnosed as the disease. If shortage of bank reserves was causing a business decline, argued economic interventionalists, why not find a way of supplying increased reserves to the banks so they never need to be short? If banks can continue to loan money indefinitely, it was claimed, there need never be any slumps in business. And so the Federal Reserve System was organized in 1913. It consisted of 12 regional Federal Reserve banks, nominally owned by private bankers, but in fact government-sponsored, controlled, and supported. Credit extended by these banks is in practice, though not legally, backed by the taxing power of the federal government. Technically, we remained on the gold standard. Individuals were still free to own gold, and gold continued to be used as bank reserves. But now, in addition to gold, credit extended by the Federal Reserve Bank's paper reserves could serve as legal tender to pay depositors. 
When business in the United States underwent a mild contraction in 1927, the Federal Reserve created more paper reserves in the hope of forestalling any possible bank reserve shortage. More disastrous, however, was the Federal Reserve's attempt to assist Great Britain, who had been losing gold to us because the Bank of England refused to allow interest rates to rise when market forces dictated. It was politically unpalatable. The reasoning of the authorities involved was as follows. If the Federal Reserve pumped excessive paper reserves into American banks, interest rates in the United States would fall to a level comparable with those in Great Britain. The reasoning of the authorities involved was as follows. If the Federal Reserve pumped excessive paper reserves into American banks, interest rates in the United States would fall to a level comparable with those in Great Britain. This would act to stop Britain's gold loss and avoid the political embarrassment of having to raise interest rates. The Fed succeeded. It stopped the gold loss, but it nearly destroyed the economies of the world in the process. The excess credit which the Fed pumped into the economy spilled over into the stock market, triggering a fantastic speculative boom. Belatedly, Federal Reserve officials attempted to sop up the excess reserves and finally succeeded in breaking the boom. But it was too late. By 1929, the speculative imbalances had become so overwhelming that the attempt precipitated a sharp retrenching and the consequent demoralizing of business confidence. As a result, the American economy collapsed. Great Britain fared even worse, and rather than absorb the full consequences of her previous folly, she abandoned the gold standard completely in 1931, tearing asunder what remained of the fabric of confidence and inducing a worldwide series of bank failures. The world economies plunged into the Great Depression of the 1930s. With a logic reminiscent of a generation earlier, statists argued that the gold standard was largely to blame for the credit debacle which led to the Great Depression. If the gold standard had not existed, they argued, Britain's abandonment of gold payments in 1931 would not have caused the failure of banks all over the world. The irony was that since 1913, we had been not on a gold standard, but on what may be termed a mixed gold standard. Yet it is gold that took the blame. But the opposition to the gold standard in any form from a growing number of welfare state advocates was prompted by a much subtler insight. The realization that the gold standard is incompatible with chronic deficit spending, the hallmark of the welfare state. Stripped of its academic jargon, the welfare state is nothing more than a mechanism by which governments confiscate the wealth of the productive members of a society to support a wide variety of welfare schemes. A substantial part of the confiscation is affected by taxation. But the welfare statists were quick to recognize that if they wished to retain political power, the amount of taxation had to be limited and they had to resort to programs of massive deficit spending. For example, they had to borrow money by issuing government bonds to finance welfare expenditures on a large scale. Under a gold standard, the amount of credit that an economy can support is determined by the economy's tangible assets, since every credit instrument is ultimately a claim on some tangible asset. But government bonds are not backed by tangible wealth, only by the government's promise to pay out of future tax revenues and cannot easily be absorbed by the financial markets. A large volume of new government bonds can be sold to the public only at progressively higher interest rates. Thus, government deficit spending under a gold standard is severely limited. The abandonment of the gold standard made it possible for the welfare statists to use the banking system as a means to an unlimited expansion of credit. They have created paper reserves in the form of government bonds which, through a complex series of steps, the banks accept in place of tangible assets and treat as if they were an actual deposit. For example, as the equivalent of what was formerly a deposit of gold. The holder of a government bond or of a bank deposit created by paper reserves believes that he has a valid claim on a real asset. But the fact is that there are now more claims outstanding than real assets. The law of supply and demand is not to be conned. As the supply of money, of claims, increases relative to the supply of the tangible assets in the economy, prices must eventually rise. Thus, the earnings saved by the productive members of the society lose value in terms of goods. When the economy's books are finally balanced, 
One finds that this loss in value represents the goods purchased by the government for welfare or other purposes with the money proceeds of the government bonds financed by bank credit expansion. In the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. If there were, the government would have to make its holding illegal, as was done in the case of gold. If everyone decided, for example, to convert all his bank deposits to silver or copper or any other good, and thereafter declined to accept checks as payment for goods, bank deposits would lose their purchasing power and government-created bank credit would be worthless as a claim on goods. The financial policy of the welfare state requires that there be no way for the owners of wealth to protect themselves. This is the shabby secret of the welfare statists to raids against gold. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process. It stands as a protector of property rights. If one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the statists' antagonism toward the gold standard. For those of you wondering, those were Greenspan's beliefs before he became head of the Federal Reserve. Really makes you wonder what happened. It's as if he went out to prove a point that if you spike the punch bowl at the party, the plebes will happily sop it all up, get totally wasted, then go back for another round without a second thought, despite the fact that they'll all be puking it out their guts the morning after. But lately, Greenspan has been making negative remarks on the state of the markets. Of course, we're where we are today because of Greenspan, or more specifically because of the Fed, but it's still rather comical that CNBC and others choose to now find ways to discredit the maestro Greenspan, their hero, so long as his perspectives, or as the Fed chairman, his actions, suit their needs. He used to be a dancer, they say. He's been full of gloom and doom as of late. Why now? What worse timing with everyone so focused on Bernanke's next move? He's a bad, bad, self-promoting marketing lad. The markets will eventually do what they're meant to do, regardless of what Greenspan says now. Back in 2000, attacking everyone and anyone who said the dot-com bubble was about to painfully burst certainly didn't stop it from happening. And, of course, we can say the same for the real estate bubble. But at least it's nice to know that attacking the naysayers makes some people, or at least some of the reporters on CNBC, feel better. <clears throat> Mr. Haynes, of course, policies can be made to propagate our feel-good, Pleasantville-like society. But, as we've again recently witnessed, It'll feel much worse once we all wake up from the delusion that this is not just a subprime problem, but a full-fledged credit and inflation-based bubble. Yet, it is interesting to know of Greenspan's earlier career perspectives. How come he doesn't discuss in his book how these perspectives changed from before he became Fed chairman? Boiling the giant machine. Perhaps Greenspan loved being the life of the party at the biggest show in town. And he certainly never wanted to be blamed again after Bush Sr. lost his re-election. In the meantime, I guess I'll just keep watching my stocks and other assets appreciate in value in their attempt to simply keep up with inflation, especially after taxes are paid on fake inflation-based profits, to the detriment of the pitiful debased value of the dollars I dare not try and save in my pocket. I'll be especially worried, however, once Bush Jr. leaves office, because historically, the party ends shortly after a new president takes office. Oh, and a point to Donald Trump. While a novel idea, good luck in getting someone to go over there, to the Middle East, that is, with leadership and telling them to stop with the crazy oil prices. I'm sure you would have been laughing in the face of anyone telling you, Enough with the insane inflated real estate prices you've been able to get for the apartments you sell. How would you feel about a real estate price cap per square foot? Or even cooler, hey, how about a price floor? Cool. I offer you the same answer that I'm quite certain you yourself would offer. If you don't like it, don't buy it. Don't. If you want lower oil prices, tell the Fed to stop adding boatloads of computerized credit liquidity into the money supply for reckless companies and hedge funds to over leverage to the edge of oblivion and allow interest rates to float freely as a true tribute to an open and free market economy. 
And perhaps you can also have Larry Kudlow explain how the Fed's monopolistic maneuverings, even admitted to by his hero, Alan Greenspan, fits in with his creed that free market capitalism is still the best path to prosperity. Finally, for anyone who really wants to understand what's going on with the Fed and how futile it really is for a small group of elite people to dictate how the world should be, watch John Stewart's interview with Alan Greenspan on The Daily Show. It's got to be the best and most honest Greenspan interview I've ever watched. Greenspan says he's been in the forecasting business for over 50 years and he's still no better than he ever was because human nature hasn't changed, because we can't improve ourselves. Actually, I would think that would make it easier for him to make predictions. Hmm, cheap and easy credit equals people going bonkers? Duh. But truth be told, one thing you could always count on was that Greenspan's predictions were always completely wrong. And his latest prediction that the credit crisis may be close to ending? Well, I guess only time will tell for certain.